Ladies and gentlemen, our last session will now begin. Dr. Choi Kang, Vice President of the ASAN Institute for Policy Studies, will be moderating the session. Dr. Choi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the last session of ASAN Plan 2019. I'm very much pleased to chair this session because we have very special guests, as you can imagine. Mr. Taehyung will finally joined us. It's very, very difficult to have him in this kind of public event, so we asked him to come to, but for the various reasons, could not put his name on the program. You can imagine what. So, but actually, he was our kind of secret weapon for the last minute, so we <laughs> kept him. So actually, I am very much grateful for his decision to join us, of course. And so I have, I'm joined by other experts like Evans Rebuild. He doesn't need any kinds of introduction at all. He makes some comments on North Korea almost every other day. So he is working as senior advisor at the Old by Stonebridge Group. And also he's a non-residential uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. So as you know, so he's working on this four-party talk, six-party talks so many times. So we are, we are together at the six-party talks and four-party talks. And then, of course, on his left, Mr. Tae Yong Ho is a former North Korean deputy ambassador to the United Kingdom, advisor researcher uh, for the Inter Institute for National Security Strategy in South Korea. Of course, his book, The, Crypto, uh, the, the Cryptography of the Third Floor Secretariat, is a very well-selling book, one of the best sell sellers in Korea. So, of course, we will be benefited by his experience in doing all the business in UK as well as other places. On his left-hand side, uh, General Yamaguchi. He w is professor at International University of Japan, and also he formerly he was a senior defense attaché to the United States, and also he was president of uh, National Defense Academy of Japan. So I'm very much delighted to have him back here again, of course. And finally, but not leastly, well-known General Yao yun so one of the, the, the leading uh, experts in these affairs. And also, she recently retired from, as a major general from the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army. And also, he, she served at the Chinese Association of Military Science. I'm sure that we'll be hearing the Chinese perspective on this issue very much. So nowadays, we are talking about so many deals, big deals, small deal bad deal, good deal. Of course, South Korean government has proposed good enough deal that has not been clarified yet. So maybe we'll be asking these questions again. But I'd like to ask you each and one of you to speak about five minutes about your old observation of a nu nuclear issue. But to take advantage of the presence of Mr. Taeyong, I'd like to give an extra minute for his presentation. So you, have, you can have any, uh, as long as you want <laughs> on your presentation. <laughs> it's an exceptional case. So, Evans? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here uh, yet again. Uh, I'm a longtime uh, participant in this forum, uh, and so it is a real honor for me to be able to be here once again. Uh, and once again, uh, Asan, and I have to thank Asan for allowing me to be here, uh, Asan has uh, done an amazing job of putting together an incredible cast of characters that have participated in, uh, in every one of these, these panels. Uh, and I'm humbled uh, to be a part, uh, not only of this overall event, but of this particular panel, uh, especially being able to uh, be on the, uh, the days with, with good friends of long standing, including a very special, a good friend, our surprise guest uh, today. Uh, there's only one problem with my, uh, my presence on, on this panel, and that is that uh, Asan has put me, a uh, former humble staff sergeant, on the same panel as two generals. Uh, <laughs> and that is a major challenge. Uh, I don't know if I'm up to it, but I will do my best. Uh, let me make uh, six quick points. Uh, the first point is that uh, we, the international community, the United States, the ROK, have spent uh, 25 years trying to get uh, the DPRK uh, to make a strategic choice about nuclear weapons. Uh, let me suggest to you today that the evidence is now clear that North Korea has made that strategic choice. 
it will keep its nuclear weapons, though it may be willing to negotiate away the unneeded or outdated elements of that nuclear weapons program for a suitably high price. Almost a decade ago, I argued that if you want to find out whether North Korea will give up its nuclear weapons, you need to talk to the only person in North Korea who counts, the North Korean leader. We've done that. We have our answer. That answer was, of course, conveyed by Kim Jong-un at the Hanoi summit when he refused to accept a common definition of what denuclearization means, when he rejected a roadmap and a timetable to achieve denuclearization, when he excluded key elements of the Yongbyon complex from any potential agreement, and when he denied the existence of secret nuclear facilities outside Yongbyon. The second point is that the summit that broke down did not break down because of differences over big deals or small deals. It broke down because North Korea did not want a denuclearization deal. And the summit didn't end because of U.S. refusal to advance towards denuclearization in a step-by-step -step fashion. Quite frankly, based on everything I've heard from folks who were there, had Kim Jong-un agreed to real denuclearization and a roadmap for attaining denuclearization, the United States side was ready to move in a step-by-step -step fashion with the DPRK to achieve denuclearization. The third point is that there is plenty of evidence that North Korea intends to remain a nuclear power, and it can be found in Kim Jong-un's speeches and significant pronouncements by Pyongyang, and if we have time, we can go into that. So now with that, let me make the fourth point. And it's a question. Are we prepared to accept a permanently nuclear-armed North Korea? If not, what can be done to end Pyongyang's pursuit of nuclear weapons? If we want the verifiable and definitive end to the North's nuclear program, the current policy approach, in my view, is highly unlikely to achieve that goal. The international sanctions regime is fraying. China and Russia are urging that we ease pressure on North Korea. Even some ROK entities have violated international sanctions. And meanwhile, President Trump, as was pointed out yesterday, sought to undo new designations of sanctions violators. Uh, and uh, these were Chinese firms that were violating international sanctions. And President Moon, of course, continues to urge sanctions easing as the key to making progress with North Korea. Frankly, all of this suggests that not only are we not applying maximum pressure on North Korea, the trend is actually to ease pressure on North Korea. Number five, there are some other signs that are equally troubling. President Moon continues to prioritize dialogue cooperation and reconciliation with North Korea over denuclearization. Meanwhile, the United States is approaching it the other way around. President Trump has said he just wants no testing. That statement, in my view, sent the worst possible message to North Korea by suggesting that all North Korean activities short of testing would be acceptable. And President Trump, President Moon, and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un all appear to have one very interesting thing in common. Each, for his own very different reasons, wants to maintain the illusion that North Korea's denuclearization is possible. That is not a prescription for denuclearizing North Korea. It's a formula that will lead to the acceptance of a nuclear-armed North Korea. And the sixth and final point is we should try, in my view, the one policy approach that we've never tried in order to compel the DPRK to make the better choice that we seek. We must apply what I like to call massive pressure on the North Korean regime using diplomatic, political, economic, trade, human rights, military, and covert measures designed 
to squeeze the DPRK's economy and convince Kim Jong-un that unless he abandons nuclear weapons, he will bring about the collapse of his regime. We have long since learned that the highest goal of Kim Jong-un is to preserve his regime. If he is faced with the possibility that his actions will bring about the collapse of that regime, I am convinced he will make a rational decision. North Korea's economy today, according to most experts, is in trouble. With that in mind, I think it's time to squeeze the regime using a broad range of new measures. The choice for the United States and South Korea is clear, since we're talking about choices today. Take major, unprecedented steps to compel the Pyongyang regime to denuclearize, or be prepared to live with a permanently nuclear-armed North Korea. Let me stop there. Thank you, Evans. Now, Mr. Te, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. And, uh, I almost uh, agree with all those uh, the comments on the current Hanoi summit by uh, the Evans. So I would rather to uh, tell you about the outcome of Hanoi summit from the perspective of former uh, North Korean uh, diplomat. Uh, I was, as long as I am concerned, I was a little bit greatly surprised by the sudden collapse of Hanoi summit on the 28th of uh, February. So, uh, and I closely followed the, the next steps of North Korea in March and in April so far. So I'd like to tell you what are the main uh, after effects for North Korea after the collapse of Hanoi summit. The first, North Korea's cult of personality in which supreme leader is ever victorious has now been shaken in its roots. Despite of the collapse of Hanoi talks from March the 1st, the North Korean media celebrated the Hanoi talks as an opportunity to set up the U.S.-North Korean relationship to a new level. Every night, North Korean TV broadcasted documentaries about Hanoi summit. However, after seven days of this sudden collapse, on March the 8th, North Korean Rodong Simun indirectly informed the North Korean people that the Hanoi summit had failed to reach an agreement. On March 15th, Che Sun Hee, then Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, held an emergency press conference in Pyongyang to make a semi-frustrated remark and semi-threat that Kim Jong-un will make a new resolute resolution. What is interesting in this uh, press conference was at that conference, there were all North Korean medias and foreign medias resident in Pyongyang, but all North Korean medias were not allowed to broadcast, to report what Che Sun Hee said in that conference. Only foreign medias were allowed to report it. On March 22nd, North Korean personnel were withdrawn from inter-Korean liaison office of Gaesong Industrial Complex, but returned with heavy feet on March 25th. So if we follow these steps of the march, we can easily understand that Kim Jong-un himself went back and forth of showing his tough, but sometimes very moderate sides. But coming into the first weeks of April, Kim Jong-un almost finished the internal discussion uh, about the Hanoi summit, and he visited construction sites of Samjion and Wonsan Galma International Coastal Tourism District to order the speed delay than originally planned. So in North Korean history, it is the first time for a supreme leader to order to finish a certain construction projects 
uh, to a certain timetable, but it is the first time for North Korean Chief Prime Leader as well to make a speech delay. Around the end of March and early April, North Korean media, including Rodong Simun, suddenly appealed to residents to the slogans of self-reliance, prepared for long sanctions, saying, arm yourself with the belief that you can live only with water and air. Right after the Hanoi talks, the tone of North Korean press was light, but from April onwards, it began to grow dark and heavy. Ever victorious image of Supreme Leader, which was seen in the departure to Hanoi and arrival in Pyongyang, can no longer be seen. But instead, clenched fists was seen at the Politburo expansion meeting on April 9. The gradual denunciation against South Korea also began to target new military exercise and new weapons introduction in South Korea. So, you know what? It is the first time in the past 30 years nuclear negotiation with America, North Korea was really severely hit. Second, I would like to tell that the son of the Hanoi, the collapse of Hanoi summit actually started and also forced North Korea to make internal economic structure. The change of prime minister from Park bong Ju to Kim Jae-ryong in the first session of 14th Supreme People's Assembly shows the vast diversion of budget from defense to civil industry started civil industry in order to cope with the sanctions. And the last aftermath, I think we can explain in the later stage about the Kim Jong-un's visit to Russia. And I think four lessons also President Trump in America learned from the Hanoi summit. The first, Hanoi summit has proven that sanctions implemented between August and December 2017 has put real pressure on North Korea and has also confirmed that Pyongyang has no will to give up its nuclear program at this moment. Number two, President Trump is even more certain, more certain that there are other hidden nuclear material production facilities apart from Yongbyon when Kim Jong-un responded with neither confirm nor deny to Trump's claim of hidden uranium enrichment sites. This, in turn, has brought a new issue to future nuclear negotiations of eliminating any suspected nuclear facilities. While these two points seem trivial, they are very important factors in future negotiation strategy for America. Number three, in the United States, Bolton's position as a hardliner has strengthened, and eventually the Trump was put in a position in which he cannot ignore the claims of hardliners. The Hanoi summit, to my impression, proved that Bolton's claim in the past years about nuclear suspect facilities in North Korea. North Korea and U.S. strategic goals and immediate me measures for the future. First, I'd like to tell about my impression about Kim Jong-un's post-Hanoi strategy. First, Kim Jong-un's policy speech made on 12th April, it is understood that North Korea's utmost goal is the maintenance and consolidation of its status as a nuclear power as well as the elevation of sanctions. Number two, it seems that Kim Jong-un's post-Hanoi strategy is divided into two stages. The first stage will last until first half of this year. During the first half of this year, 
Kim Jong-un's main goal is to show himself as a determined and unyielding leader to the North Korean people and secure economic support from Russia and China to cope with sanctions. The return of military demonstrations, including combat air force training and new guided missile tests, were intended to create an appearance of strong leadership to the North Korean people. The goal of his planned visit to Russia is to gain food aid and stop the possible expulsion of all North Korean workers in Russia following the UN sanctions before the end of this year. Kim Jong-un may even try to invite President Xi Jinping Peter Pyongyang before any inter-Korean or North Korean-US summit. The second stage will start from later of this year. Kim Jong-un may be slowly signaling the interest in holding summit to South Korea and in US. In the third summit with the Trump, Kim Jong-un may even deliver new deal like opening nuclear hidden facilities in exchange for lifting partial UN sanctions. I think uh, this point is very important because if we have followed the March and the first two weeks, April, of North Korea's res response to America so far, North Korea has not yet commented anything on so-called nuclear suspected facilities. In Hanoi, North Korean Foreign Minister Ri yong did not comment on it. Che sun did not comment on it. Even Kim Jong-un's policy speech on April 12th even though Kim Jong-un said about the long war with self-reliance, but he did not specifically indicate whether she would re continue to refuse to accept this so-called additional nuclear suspected facilities or not. So there is a probability that Kim Jong-un will try to make a new deal with the President Trump. If Kim Jong-un succeeds in this kind of small deal with Trump, it can be understood in North Korea that he consolidates his nuclear status by keeping his nuclear missiles in safe. For President Trump, to my understanding, the immediate United States goal is prevent North Korea's nuclear weapons from directly threatening the United States by continuing to maintain North Korea's moratorium on nuclear and ICBM tests. Furthermore, the U.S. aim is to prevent North Korean nuclear program from leaking to Middle East, where the United States has a core national interest. The United States sees North Korea's denuclearization as a long-term issue. President Trump has said that she will not rush denuclearization negotiations. She also sent Kim Jong-un a congratulatory message to commemorate Kim Jong-il's birthday. Rather than completely solving nuclear issue, President Trump is more concerned with maintaining current North Korea's moratorium. As long as North Korea does not resume nuclear or missile tests, President Trump said he will not issue new sanctions. It seems to me that he will meet Kim Jong-un's long war with a long run. There is a high probability that President Trump may agree to relief of five main sanctions in return for Yongbyon and the other nuclear hidden material production facilities. So in conclusion, I would like to say that we are not in safe zone yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Te, especially sharing your thought, your own understanding of what's going on inside North Korea. And maybe you have already alluded to North Korea's calculus and their strategy ahead of us. Thank you very much. We'll come back to the question about especially about the, your comments on U.S. strategy. So now I'd like to invite General 
Yamaguchi for your Japanese perspective. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Chegan. And uh, before getting into the point, I, I'd like to thank uh, the Asan Institute uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, very interesting occasion. And particularly uh, thank to, to uh, Dr. Chu Munjun and Dr. <laughs> Dr. Han, Han Chibun and uh, Dr. Chegan for, um, to, uh, for having kept inviting me uh, to the plenum. I'm so proud of being one of the uh, record holders of the, in terms of the number, um, how many times I participated <laughs> in uh, plenums. Um, um, thank you very much for that. And, and I, um, I, I am going to uh, the talk about just three things. Uh, one is the uh, possible scenarios, and the second point is uh, what uh, uh, the real threat uh, from uh, North Korea. And the uh, third is uh, um, we have to uh, mind the gap between gaps between relevant actors. The first of all, uh, the title I like the title of this uh, panel: um, CBID or peaceful, uh, peaceful uh, coexistence. Uh, but theoretically speaking, uh, CBID and, and peaceful coexistence are not necessarily uh, mutually exclusive. Um, there should be three, the, uh, three, uh, three dimensions, peaceful or bloody, coexisting and confrontation, and CBD and uh, failure of denuclearization. Uh, therefore, there must be uh, theoretically eight cases. Um, uh, I'm not going to uh, go through all the cases, uh, but from uh, the best one, uh, peaceful CVID and peaceful coexistence. Uh, maybe many of you may uh, laugh. And the worst uh, one, the bloody failure of denuclearization and bloody confrontation, even a conflict uh, uh, between the two. Um, it means the second, second Korean War uh, with nuclear weapons. Um, it, is a, it is a nightmare, everybody's nightmare. In between, there are a couple of uh, scenarios uh, we might have to think seriously. Uh, one is peaceful failure of denuclearization, not peaceful coexistence, and could be more likely than others, um, while root cause uh, remains, and this is the main theme of this session. Root cause uh, is North Korea's uh, the existence of nuclear pro uh, uh, programs. Uh, if uh, this case, uh, if uh, we uh, go to this scenario, um, this should not be that uh, ultimate goal. Ultimate goal um, there must be uh, further. And another one is uh, peaceful failure of denuclearization and remain, uh, remaining confrontation. It is something like back to the future. Uh, we don't want to, to, uh, to uh, go back to that future. And somehow, not uh, necessarily bloody, uh, bloody but uh, somehow uh, the problematic uh, CBID and remaining confrontation uh, could be one of the worst and antithesis of uh, the uh, most likely scenario. Uh, but uh, we need to avoid that. Um, so the, my conclusion here is uh, peaceful and CVID coexistence. Um, we need to, uh, it's a, not a digital one, or 100 or zero, uh, all or nothing. So um, better, the better part of combination uh, is what uh, we need to uh, look at. And uh, second point is uh, uh, we need to look at the threat. Uh, first, threat first, uh, first threat is uh, from missile and uh, nuclear program. It's a physical threat. Um, this uh, has uh, uh, some problematic uh, dimensions uh, uh, with ranges. Um, uh, the threat of medium to long range missiles and nuclear programs. Uh, North Korea's ballistic missiles program along with its nucle nuclear program pose directly uh, extremely serious uh, threat uh, of mass destruction to the country within the range of those missiles. So um, while Japan is uh, concerned about medium range missiles such as Nodon with a range of 1500 kilometers, um, the, may be, North Korea may be uh, concerned about shorter range uh, uh, missiles and even uh, artillery, uh, long range artillery. Uh, while uh, US uh, may be only concerned about physical threat uh, from um, uh, ICBM. So those uh, the threat perception uh, difference uh, may cause a difference, uh, difference in uh, policy priorities. That is one of the things uh, I need to mention at that last, uh, my last uh, point. And another threat, uh, serious, uh, is a threat to non-proliferation regime. Uh, if we um, the, make the result as a bad model uh, for going nuclear, getting money, or going nuclear, get, uh, getting uh, better off. 
uh, to the rest of uh, the world. This is really, really bad um, yeah, news for uh, the rest of the world. Um, I, am, I have to concern about my children and grandchildren uh, age um, about uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons, where um, all the countries in Africa or the Middle East uh, want to go, um, uh, go nuclear. That is what, uh, exactly what we want to, uh, to avoid. Uh, so uh, that is a hypo theoretical one, but uh, physically, if uh, North Korea, um, the, the ambassador suggested, uh, uh, provide the other country with uh, those technologies, um, it, is, uh, it will pose um, physical, uh, really uh, serious threat uh, to the world as a whole. And last one is threat of uh, uh, stability of North, uh, Korean Peninsula. I am concerned about the uh, mobilization ratio of uh, North Korea. Uh, the 1.2 million uh, soldiers, uh, soldiers are standing. Uh, this is 5% uh, uh, of the uh, whole population. Uh, that 5% of mobilization is uh, exactly the same as uh, Japan, uh, August 1945. Uh, when uh, Japan was losing war, um, every young, uh, young people uh, went to the front line. Nobody was uh, working at the industry, uh, at the agriculture as well. So I am very much concerned about uh, North Korean economy uh, in that sense. We have to be uh, careful. Uh, the bottom line uh, is uh, we need to uh, care about uh, uh, gaps between um, among us uh, on threat perception, uh, leading the policy uh, uh, priority dif uh, differences. And another uh, point is uh, differences in uh, roles to, to play, uh, uh, Japan's role to play now, and Korea, South Korea's uh, uh, role to play now, US role to play now, uh, may be uh, different. And th those roles uh, may, um, another uh, difference that we have to mind, time to play such significant role. Um, for instance, uh, last year, maybe in the last uh, year and a half, uh, South Korea has been playing very, very important role uh, to bridge uh, North, North Korea and the, the United States. And the uh, U.S. is now playing a great role. Um, the, uh, China has played a significant role uh, to make the six party uh, work together. And uh, Japan uh, may uh, have uh, the time to play in the future uh, for uh, the prosperous and peaceful um, um, North Korea uh, after uh, making good deal uh, <coughs> for the future of uh, um, Northeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Yamaguchi. Now, I'd like to invite General Yao for your yeah. comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have several uh, brief points. The first is I do not agree that uh, we have only two choices as the uh, topic of this panel suggests. That is, we, have, we can have CV, uh, CVID, or to use a more fashionable term uh, nowadays, that is the final fully verified denuclearization. Um, all all uh, peaceful coexistence, which I think suggests the acceptance of DPRK as a somewhat nuclear weapon armed state. Uh, there is a choice for relevant players to, uh, relevant players in the Northeast Asia to make, except apart from uh, North Korea, and also for the international community to make. Um, so far, I think still China's position is that the best way is to achieve the the nuclearization through peaceful and negotiations through through peace peaceful means and negotiations, and to denuclearize, and at the same time to build long-term peace and stability mechanisms on the peninsula. Uh, so far, we have not exhausted all our diplomatic diplomatic resources. So what we should do now is to keep the positive momentum on the peninsula to move forward with another, maybe the fourth uh, summit between North and the South, uh, to continue working level uh, dialogue or negotiations between North Korea and, and United States, uh, and to keep the door open for a future third summit between President Trump and the Chairman Kim. And also to encourage DPRK to reach out internationally 
uh, he's in Vladivostok today, the, 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 uh, the Chairman Kim. So he, starting from last year, he's reaching, so far he has visited, he had had four summits uh, with Chinese President Xi Jinping and uh, a two summit with uh, President Trump and uh, three, three summit with uh, President Moon and one summit with uh, President Putin. And he has also reached out to Mongolia, to Vietnam. And uh, I think they are, these are very uh, positive and good things so that we should first and foremost to keep what we have achieved so far. And, and regarding the uh, reduction of tensions, for example, the suspension of the tests, nuclear and missile tests, and also the suspension of military exercise, and not to give up our efforts based on the conclusion that the current DPRK leader is following the path of his father and grandfather and playing the old trick, the old tricks, again to fool the international community. We must try it to the last, try him to the last minute so that we will never have opportunity missed. Um, so the best choice for all of us, as I said, denuclearization through peaceful means. However, it is also very important to, to make clear what denuclearization means. Um, I know there are differences between uh, DPRK and the United States, and maybe also between China and the United States and ROK. So does it mean all the existing weapon systems of North Korea, or all the nuclear weapon capabilities, or all the nuclear capabilities, including peaceful use, does it also include the withdrawal of U.S. extended nuclear umbrella to ROK? Or is it just refers to North Korea, not the whole peninsula? So uh, I think a serious discussion is needed, not only between, China, between United States and DPRK, but also among the major players in the region. Second is the final, if the final goal is to denuclearize, to denucle, to, is to denu, denu, uh, denuclearization and to have peace, how to get there from here? So any choice that leads up to the final goal is a good choice. So this goal can be achieved with a big deal or a series of, of small deals. So let us just do it. It should be a result-based approach through which both sides or all related sides have to get to the benefits and also have to take the risks together. Not only the benefit, but also the risks the risks of uncertainty, the risks of reversion. But it's a risk that we have to, to, to take to deal with issues, such a dif difficult issue. Um, and on the how, how to achieve issue, uh, I think that we should make the most uh, workable, feasible, and the and mutually accept acceptable uh, ones as the best choice. That is, that is why China supports a phased, step-by-step, -step, synchronized approach to promote the negotiating process. Given the fact of the absence of strategic trust between DPRK and the United States, the big deal may be perceived by the North Korea as a big trap or a big conspiracy. For denuclearization, especially when it is with inspection and verification regimes, are very hard to reverse. 
while the uh, political ac acceptance, security assurance, and economic assistance are things that are highly reversible. My last point, what should be a good choice for uh, ROK to make? My humble suggestion is to continue the current policy of engaging with the North in a positive interactive mode and pursuing the United States to talk with the, with the North. I, I, I really give great credit to President Moon for his working extremely hard to achieve what we have today. China is in full support of improving relations and promoting reconciliation and cooperation between the North and the South, and would like to see more high-level exchanges, including more summits. And China supports a bigger role of, the, uh, of South Korea in advancing the political settlement of the uh, Korean Peninsula issue. And I, uh, I, 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 on yesterday, one of the panels, I think that uh, 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 one point is that ROK should not be a mediator, a mediator between the North and the, the United States because it is an ally of the United States. So it should be take the side of the United States all the time. But I don't think that the ROK should be concerned about its uh, mediating role with the, US, with the United States. For the meaning of an alliance is for the interest of the ROK. And the alliance is to keep peace and stability on the peninsula. Mediation is also in the interest of the ROK and the peace and stability on the peninsula. I will stop here. Thank you. So I have some huge differences between China and the United States, between myself and General Yao, actually. <laughs> so it seems to me that I'd like to ask Evans to respond to General Yao's comments and also about this uh, Mr. Tess understanding of U.S. policy whether he correctly described the Trump's policy toward the North Korea or is any kinds of point you'd like to add or correct? Please. Uh, let me make a comment about the role of the ROK as, as mediator, uh, since that is a, is a hot topic these days. Uh, I think I reflect the views of, of many Americans who are troubled when we hear that word. Uh, the ROK is, and, and I should also uh, preface this by saying that uh, my view of that issue is uh, quite similar to the DPRK's view, <laughs> strangely enough. Uh, the DPRK made it very clear recently that the, uh, the ROK uh, cannot be a mediator because the ROK is an ally of the United States of America. Pyongyang gets that, uh, and I, I get that as well. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, the ROK, President Moon, can play an extremely important role in explaining uh, the, uh, the essence of, of the U.S. demand to the North Koreans uh, and uh, reaffirming his support for that and vice versa, communicating to the United States things that uh, are, being, uh, uh, are being said by the North Koreans. But uh, it's, it's very difficult as an American to see an American ally, a treaty ally, uh, 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 try to, to stand in the middle between ourselves and the North Koreans. I, uh, we were chatting uh, over coffee a little bit earlier today, and I remarked that if North Korea invades the Republic of Korea, the United States is not going to be a mediator. Uh, the United States will fight and die by its ally, <laughs> and North Korea knows that. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I would hope that uh, folks here in Korea would, un would understand that. Uh, let me, let me just stop there. I don't want to, okay, I don't sure. want to dominate the, the conversation. So, Mr. Tech, any no, comments? Oh, uh, these, uh, these days, in the past uh, the uh, few weeks, North Korea's, uh, the level of financiation against South Korea is almost frustration and angry. <laughs> so, uh, uh, why North Korea is so much frustrated and angry, I think it is very important to 
uh, understand the feelings of North Korea towards South Korea. I think uh, in this regard, uh, South Korean uh, the government must be very practical in dealing uh, the relations between America and South Korea. For instance, what was agreed and achieved in uh, September Pyongyang Declaration when President Moon visited North Korea, President Moon and Kim Jong-un agreed that uh, South Korea will deliver uh, the resumption of Kaesong and Kumgangsan in return for the total dismantlement of Yongbyon uh, the facilities. Yes. So if we go back to uh, last year's September uh, uh, declaration, the question is, uh, can South Korean government make that kind of promise to uh, North Korea on behalf of America? <laughs> yeah, so oh, Kim Jong-un this time uh, left for Hanoi because she was quite confident that if he uh, delivered the Yongbyon facility, she was sure that President Trump would agree to accept it and mm -hmm. release at least Kaesong and Kumgangsan project. But his, uh, Kim Jong-un's expectation was uh, wrong. So naturally, when he failed in this a summit, I think the frustration came from a kind of uh, uh, conviction, wrong conviction on President Trump. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think in the future, when South Korean government want to try to mediate or want to accelerate whatever role uh, the South Korean government wants to play, I think South Korean government should be practical in dealing with on North Korea. Something like South Korean government should not make any promises to Kim Jong-un which South Korea cannot really control at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very important point. Okay. Uh, if I could go back to this issue of uh, criticism of Pyongyang directed at the ROK, uh, it's really important at this point for folks to go back and take a look at Kim Jong-un's last two New Year's addresses. Mm -hmm. uh, significant portions of those two speeches, and they're remarkable speeches, uh, are directed not at the United States, they're directed at the ROK. And the intention of those speeches, I think, is, uh, is, is threefold. Number one is to appeal to this sort of pan-Korean nationalism, uh, uri minjo kiri, mm -hmm. we Koreans among ourselves, we can fix these things, we don't need those Americans. Uh, that's number one. Number two, an obvious effort in both of those speeches to try to drive a wedge between the ROK and the United States. I mean, very specific language directed at that. But number three, there's a very clear message in each of those two speeches, uh, a message to the ROK that the price that the Republic of Korea is going to have to pay to improve North-South relations uh, is to distance itself from the United States and to fundamentally reassess the ROK-US alliance relationship. All of those messages come, come through very, very clearly in those two speeches. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with that. <laughs> okay, yeah. General Yao. Yeah, may, may, may I? Um, uh, just a, a quick response to Ivan's uh, remark that uh, uh, when no South Korea is invaded by North Korea, United States would not be mediating. But the current situation is that uh, North Korea has not invaded. Ah, okay, North Korea has not invaded the United States. And that, uh, uh, it seems that uh, uh, the nuclear issue, uh, especially the ballistic missile capabilities against the United States, had uh, changed the uh, equilibrium of the uh, airlines relationship so that the United States has think, uh, is thinking that uh, 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 okay, South Koreans have to, to be with us all the time because United States is under the threat of nuclear weapons. And now it's time for South Korea to commit to the defense, uh, to, 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 to be committed to the defense treaty, to take part, to, to shoulder your part 
of the defense commitment. Is that right? I don't think that's an accurate characterization of, uh -huh. of where the United States so is coming why, from. So why that kind <laughs> of uh, <laughs> remark about uh, is mm. South mm. Korea invaded, we will not be looking, we will not be meditating. Mm. So well, why that remark? Mm. I, I think that's uh, just uh, a little bit The United States has been to me. very supportive of the idea of North-South dialogue. Mm. Uh, President Trump, uh, Secretary Pompeo, and others in the United States government have made it very clear that we support and appreciate what's, what's happening in terms of North-South dialogue. But as I said in my opening remarks, uh, there is a concern about the, the relative prioritization, prioritization of these issues. Uh, with uh, a, a almost single-minded focus here in Seoul on uh, reconciliation, uh, on dialogue and cooperation between North and South. And I understand that. Uh, but a prioritization of that over denuclearization. And keep in mind that those missiles and nuclear weapons are also aimed at the Republic of Korea. And so it, it is puzzling to many Americans that there is not that level of concern, intense concern here, as there is in Japan and in, in the United States about that threat. <laughs> General, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I was thinking of uh, why um, things happened in the last two years. Um, um, I was thinking of 2017, uh, when uh, we had uh, so many missile tests. Um, several of them flew over Japan, and uh, one, um, one was uh, um, one had the possibility to reach uh, the United States. And the test of uh, nuclear weapon uh, of uh, um, yield of 160 kiloton, that is uh, 10 times larger than Hiroshima, mm. Hiroshima bomb. At that time, um, everybody came to the very close point uh, in terms of threat perception. Um, even Chinese media um, was uh, worried about the North Korea going too far. And the U.S. Uh, US uh, threat perception, um, I feel like uh, the coming closer to Japan or uh, South Koreans uh, because of ICBM, um, physical threat to uh, the U.S. Uh, itself. So uh, basically, they, you know, we are scared. And also, what the U.S. did was uh, interesting, um, the concentrating three aircraft carrier groups uh, in, in around the uh, peninsula, and the Ohio class uh, submarines with 100 uh, plus uh, tomahawks uh, to uh, twice uh, port visit to Busan. It has a sort of body language. Um, I have a, pot a possibility to kill you. Now, then I think uh, no side is also scared uh, because of scare uh, that both sides are scared. Um, they. Um, had an in incentive to come to the, the table of negotiation. In addition, um, the, for the in, uh, upside, uh, North, Korea, the, the North Korea's leader might have known the importance of uh, prosperity or the European way or the modern way of uh, becoming prosperous uh, uh, state. Uh, so um, he had a hope. Uh, I, I really hope that he he, he had a hope uh, to, to, to become a little bit more normal country and uh, more prosperous. So, uh, and also, um, President uh, Trump might have had a uh, dream to become a Nobel Prize winner uh, kind of uh, thing. But anyway, uh, he was trying to do something positive. So um, the positive incentive was there, but basically uh, they were scared. And he, you know, it is hard to uh, prove that uh, uh, the security assurance, uh, we, don't, we don't harm you. It is easy to uh, uh, prove that we can harm you whenever I, uh, I want. And it, uh, it is hard to uh, prove you that we, don't, uh, we abandon uh, nuclear programs, but it is easy to prove that we are going to, uh, to, uh, to continue nuclear programs if we, if we want to. So, the uh, scare part uh, may, made everybody uh, to, to think about uh, peaceful uh, ways. Of course. <laughs> I'd like to <laughs> ask a question about the actual general, you mentioned that the concept of denuclearization, scope of denuclearization. Actually, now the U.S. administration uses denuclearization of North Korea, right. not the Korean Peninsula. So I like to ask General Yao, what is Chinese concept and scope mm. of denuclearization? But still, South Korean government is using the 
the concept of word, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. When I heard it, it was, what do you mean by that? Does that mean the elimination of U.S. nuclear umbrella vis-a-vis South Korea? Yeah. No? Yeah. I, I, I think yeah, the Chinese uh, position, Chinese always use the, 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 the phrase that the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, that includes not only the DPRK, but also other nuclear weapon factors on the peninsula. Such as? So, such as <laughs> the <coughs> nuclear weapon element in the extended deterrence provided by United States to Republic of Korea, and also maybe, maybe the possibility that uh, you will have redeployment of technical nuclear weapons back on the Korean Peninsula. But anyway, the, the, uh, the current extended deterrence uh, provided by the United States has a nuclear weapon element in it. If you ask the North Korea to, new, to denuclearize fully, uh, finally, fully verifiably, uh, what's that? Uh, denuclearization. You, 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 if, if, if you accept that, and if you, it, it is on the path to, 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 the, to achieve it. So what's the justification for our K to still have the nuclear extended deterrence? I mean, only the nuclear, you still have the conventional extended deterrence. Hmm. Of course. Evans would like to respond back to the question. Of <laughs> Two points. <laughs> uh, in <coughs> December of last year, yes. there was a fascinating DPRK commentary that appeared in a, uh, in a newspaper by a very authoritative uh, DPRK writer in which he said, and I'm paraphrasing now, uh, the United States should not think that the, deep, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula means the denuclearization <laughs> of the DPRK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a remarkable statement when you it's think about it. Very reasonable. Uh, is it? Uh, <laughs> uh, because it, and, and that statement basically confirmed a point that uh, a number of us who write about this issue in this room have been saying for quite some time. The other point is the, the last significant conversation I had with a, a senior DPRK official, he said something astonishing to me. Uh, he kept using the phrase denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And when I asked him to define it, he defined it in the usual fashion. Uh, the end of the US-ROK alliance, the withdrawal of US troops from the Korean Peninsula, uh, the end of the US nuclear umbrella, and the end of the deployment of strategic and tactical assets in the Western Pacific that target the DPRK. And then he added something else. And he said, and of course, the strategic and tactical systems that you Americans deploy in the United States that could be used against us are also matters of concern to us. <laughs> so uh, that, at which point I, mm. I responded to him, I if I that is your policy, standard for denuclearization, it's, it's, it's then we're never issue. getting there. It's not a capability issue, it's a policy issue. If you make the policy that uh, the extended deterrence has no nuclear weapon element, I think it will be fine. It's a policy issue, it's not a capability issue. The DPRK cannot exchange its arsenal with the entire nuclear arsenal of the United States. That's impossible. But it's a policy issue. If you can make that statement and make it institutionalized in a certain way, that would be a security assurance. But actually, mm -hmm. let me remind General Yao, because actually, it's OK. You can say it's a policy issue. But actually, North Korea has shown the attitude that policy issue always be used by for other reasons. And also, that's, that's the beginning of additional demands coming from North Korean side very well. So I think that we must be very careful about when you say you have nuclear elements on the Korean Peninsula. Actually, we like to have it, them, them back in the Korean Peninsula because the situation is getting worse and worse every day. And more and more people are arguing for reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons because when we had our talks with Americans, they said, oh, no way. 
<laughs> no way to get them back on the Korean Peninsula. That's form. We can use our advanced conventional weapons to guarantee your security commitment of the United States vis-a-vis -vis South Korea. So I'm wondering why you are saying that there's a nuclear element in extended deterrence. If there is no nuclear element in the extended deterrence, just say it. Make mm -hmm. a statement that the the the. Defense but commitment. actually, General Yao, because I'm a moderator, I, I don't want to get into the debates about <laughs> it, but actually, the problem is that this. we are faced with a direct, clear, and present threat coming from North Korea. Mm. Definitely, we should not forget it. We have been dealing this issue for the past 27 years, yes. but the situation has got worse than better. We had agreed several agreements with, the, with North Korea, General Agreement Framework. So, if, if North Korea's if North Korea think that it's okay to, to have the nuclear element in the extended deterrence, and it will be willing to the nuclear rise completely, fully, finally, or whatever, it's, it's fine for China. China would have no objection to North Korea accepting to, 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 to define the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in whatever way. Okay, mm -hmm. I'd like yes. to make apologies for being a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, actually, I'd like to make my own comments. Okay, Mr. Okay? Yes, I think uh, the term of denuclearization uh, of Korean Peninsula uh, uh, is uh, defined by North Korean regime a couple of times. So I think. Uh, there is no point to further discuss what does it mean because North Korea clearly stated a couple of times. Uh, another thing I think uh, uh, the question is uh, why North Korea continues to say about denuclearization of North Korea? What is their real purpose? And do they really believe in achieving that? The real purpose of saying, continue to say denuclearization is to drive U.S. forces out from uh, South Korea. That is North Korea's belief. And many people uh, may think that it is a, a stupid, you know, how United States can ever withdraw their troops from Korean Peninsula. That cannot be achievable. That, was, that is the general concept in South Korea and America. But do North Korean people believe in that way? As a former North Korean diplomat, I do not believe in uh, that theory, I, say, I, I believe that if North Korea uh, continues to have these nuclear weapons for another decade, I think it will change America's strategy on Korean Peninsula. And one day, America may make a very strategic decision whether to continue stay in South Korea or withdraw. Because what I was taught in the past several decades in North Korean system that it will be achieved. History always happens again and again. Let's go back to 1940s when Soviet Union succeeded in their new first nuclear weapons. In 1950, America decided to draw Atchison line. Mm -hmm. So that is the first case that America changed its strategy. In 1960s, when China uh, succeeded in autumn bomb in 1965, America policy was not changed. But in 67, when China succeeded in hydrogen bomb, all of a sudden, American strategy started to change. And it took only two years for American administration to declare Nixon doctrine. Nixon doctrine came in 1969, only two years after the mm -hmm. China's success in hydrogen. What's the main content of Nixon doctrine? Nixon doctrine is solve the Asia issues by Asians. And America decided to withdraw its troops from Vietnam and finally Taiwan as well. So the history proves that whenever there is a new nuclear state in this region, it always resulted in changing the American strategy. That is the strong belief North Koreans have. Okay, thank you. Actually, we don't have much time, so, but before going, actually, before opening up the floor, like, actually, I'd like to one question, because I think maybe by now, Kim Jong-un has arrived in Vladivostok. Yes. So, what is your hunch of the outcome of Putin 
and Kim Jong Un summit. Evans, uh, I suspect Kim Jong Un has a shopping list uh, in the aftermath of uh, the breakdown of what happened in uh, in Hanoi, uh, for reasons that uh, Ambassador Tay mentioned earlier. Uh, there is a sense of concern, uh, maybe even desperation, mm -hmm. uh, that the sanctions easing or the path to sanctions easing that the DPRK thought it might be on uh, is not going to be realized and certainly not any, any time soon. So North Korea uh, needs an outlet. Uh, North Korea needs uh, to uh, shore up its economy through whatever mechanism is possible. Uh, North Korea needs to reach out to uh, friendly countries uh, to see how it can maximize uh, short-term, medium-term, and long-term assistance, mm -hmm. uh, trade, uh, laborers, uh, humanitarian assistance, food, fuel, all, all of those things and more. Uh, but having said that, uh, despite the fact that the North Korean shopping list will probably be fairly long, there are limits to what the Russians are going to be able to do here mm -hmm. because of the constraints imposed by those international sanctions. So I'm not anticipating anything, anything radical mm -hmm. uh, coming out of that meeting. I, I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that Kim Jong-un uh, may, may get uh, quite a lot uh, mm -hmm. from uh, President Putin. The first is what uh, Kim Jong-un is concerned most is the legitimation of his uh, leadership. Uh, in this region. Kim Jong-un is the youngest leader in this region, but he wants to stay in the power for the next at least three or four decades. So consolidation is very important. How he wants to do it? Uh, in, internally, he has his own policy to consolidate his power, but externally, he has to be in the same level with the major players of this region. So last year he met uh, Xi Jinping uh, three times, this year one time with President Moon, three times, even Trump, second time. So now is the time for Kim Jong-un to <laughs> meet the other major players. So now it's time for him to even meet Putin, yes. Mm. And then next time his plan may be, I think he wants to meet Abe. So only, he, only when he finishes meeting all these major players in this region, he can say that he finally consolidated as one of the leaders in this region. So whatever he gets from President Putin, the meeting with the president himself itself is a really a great you know, the benefit to uh, uh, Kim Jong-un. The second thing is that the meeting itself gave a great hope to North Korean people. After the collapse of Hanoi mm -hmm. summit, mm -hmm. North Korean media has continued to you know, uh, appeal to its people to be ready in, for the long war with self-reliance of all these slogans. And uh, North Korea's media was very dim. But all of a sudden, you know, they started to broadcast that Kim Jong-un is leaving for Russia. The difference between the previous visit and this visit is that North Korea announced the plan of his visit in advance. Yes. Why North Korea this time announced in advance? Because Kim Jong-un wants to give a kind of hope mm -hmm. to its people. Mm -hmm. So whatever he gets from President Putin is not very important. Second, he has already given a great hope to North Korean citizens. The third is what Evan said is those uh, shopping lists. For instance, I think that food aid. Mm. Uh, North Korea is very difficult until the coming June. Usually, the June and May is the most difficult period for North Korea for food. Mm -hmm. And if you see the recent, you know, the movements in the United Nations, uh, Russia now is pushing America to uh, open the humanitarian food aid to North Korea. As a permanent member of the United mm -hmm. Nations Security mm -hmm. Council, North, North Russia is one of the advocates, and on 14th of April, the Russia has already announced that it will deliver around two tons of wheat to North Korea. So maybe this time, President Putin did not openly announce how much he will give to uh, Kim Jong-un as a kind of food aid, mm -hmm. but he will give an emergency food aid to Kim Jong-un, and American President Trump cannot say no to him because mm -hmm. it is for humanitarian, humanitarian. purpose. Mm -hmm. So. He can get at least something. Mm -hmm. And then the, another thing is uh, 
labor force. Labor now they are around, yes. yes. In far eastern areas, there are around 20 to 30 North Korean laborers. Uh, 20 to 30? Yeah, uh, roughly. There is no specific statistics. Mm -hmm. Russians uh, do, not, uh, do not open it. The point is that President Putin and Kim Jong un, both of them, share the same goal of keeping these forces mm -hmm. in this region. Mm -hmm. Because if North, if Russia expels them all following the UN sanctions, then where can Russia, you know, bring, invite these forces to replace North Koreans? Because North Koreans are the only nation in the world who can work in that very difficult Siberian winter. Okay. Yes, Thank he you. can't bring <laughs> anyway. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Actually, the, uh, the Ambassador Ted mentioned of the possibility that the Kim Jong Un offer to meet. Prime Minister Abe. Yeah. Is that fine with Japanese um, side? Yeah, the, 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 no, nobody knows uh, when mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Abe meets uh, Kim Jong Un. Uh, we didn't know uh, when um, the Prime Minister Komiz, uh, Koizumi was uh, meeting, mm -hmm. um, meeting, uh, as a me uh, going to Pyongyang. So I, 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 I'm not going to predict that. Uh, but uh, uh, talking about Putin. Um, Russia is uh, relevant uh, and very influential uh, actor uh, with, with, uh, with less stakes in this region. Mm -hmm. So uh, Russia has uh, uh, less, uh, less things uh, to lose, mm -hmm. uh, less to lose uh, in, in, in comparison with the other five, uh, five nations. That means Russia has um, wider uh, you know, uh, cards to play. Mm -hmm. uh, that may cause sometimes good part and uh, sometimes really, really dangerous part. OK, thank you. General Rao? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, General uh, Yamag Yamaguchi that uh, uh, Russia is actually not uh, the least relevant player in this Northeast Asia. So uh, this summit is important in political and diplomatical, uh, it has the political and, dip and diplomatical significance not much in, uh, so how to say it, it's uh, uh, the, the uh, Chairman King can get economic, uh, can get political and diplomatic, diplomatical gains, but not much economically and uh, financially or, or, or whatever the shopping list is, except humanitarian assistance. Thank you. Now I'd like to open the floor. I like, okay, okay, Jonathan. So make it very quick, we don't have much time. I, 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 I know we don't have much time. <laughs> Thank you, it's very good to see you again. It's mic, okay. Very mm. candid, uh, in your Is that on? I don't think it's on. Uh, it's not on? Yeah, oh, it's there on. You go, there you go. Yeah, it's on. Anyhow, uh, it's on. I really appreciate the entire panel, but in particular, our mystery guest. Um, my, my question is, a, is to try to look at something that you did raise, which it seems as if Kim Jong-un is acknowledging in the aftermath of the failure in Hanoi, a kind of an internal reassessment in some of what he has said, in some of the statements that he is making. In, in your judgment, do you think in some sense his own infallibility uh, has suffered as a consequence of the failure at Hanoi? And does it suggest, in some sense, he, he had bigger expectations of President Trump than uh, have been fulfilled? Um, Thank you. Hmm. I uh, think the current no, no, summit. You, you can wait. Let also, me collect okay. more, a little bit more questions. First, Kim, and then God. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, make one comment. Um, is anybody seriously, seriously observing Russia? Uh, I was in Paris, Four Seasons, Russian oligarch uh, rented for one week. Lukin, head of intelligence, everybody. Russians, only one thing is to lift the sanctions of the U.S. and save what relations with Trump. Iranian nuclear deal, North Korean nuclear, they don't care. So, you know, uh, General Zhao, Dr. Zhao, uh, I think you should really do your homework before coming. Economics and political stakes, you're right, but they have absolutely no role whatsoever. Iranians know it, North Koreans know it. I think maybe it's better to be a bit frank. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll the, uh, 
uh, question for Mr. Evans. The, uh, according to a document published by the U.S. State Department and Treasury and Coast Guard last month, U.S. government officially acknowledged the possibility where North Korea managed to acquire a significant amount of oil despite the U.N. oil embargo. Uh, it's almost like an 85% equivalent amount of the North Korea's annual oil import prior to the institution of the U.N. oil embargo. Now, the North Korean network still maintain a robust smuggling capabilities of prohibited commodities. And the, the current political environment uh, is not uh, contributing to strengthen any more pressure. But your uh, our proposal on the massive pressure, uh, how do you reconstruct the so-called massive pressure against North Korea, uh, given this uh, loosening our international conditions. And so long as North Korea may continue to remain quiet, maybe yeah, it, 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 it will be really difficult. Uh, grateful for your thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, that's one, Evans and Ambassador Ted. Yes. Um, I have advocated and continue to advocate using this approach of massive pressure. I am not too sanguine that either my government or other governments will sign on to this, to be very frank with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to be very pessimistic about where we end up. Uh, I believe that we end up, going back to the original question that was posed for this panel, in a situation in which we have effectively uh, agreed to live with a nuclear-armed North Korea. I'm not advocating that. Uh, but I fear that that is where we may end up if we do not shift our policy. And the, if you take nothing away from my presentation today, it is that we have one more opportunity to get it right uh, in the coming months, an opportunity that is, uh, that is raised by the fact that the North Korean economy is going through difficulties, uh, and we should take advantage of this. But. Uh, I am one of those people who were extremely nervous to the point of being terrified that the Hanoi summit was going to go the way of the Singapore summit, uh, in which we were going to give away some really important equities to the North Koreans one more time. Uh, you'll notice I haven't said that the Hanoi summit failed. Uh, I think it succeeded in a very interesting way mm -hmm. because the President of the United States did not do what many of us thought he was going to do in Hanoi. So in that sense, it succeeded. But I am really concerned uh, that the message coming from Washington is this message of complacency with where we are right now, that as long as they're not testing, everything is okay. Uh, and if we keep on that track, <laughs> and if we don't shift gears uh, and begin to use uh, the various tools that we have in our toolkit, to further pressure uh, the North Koreans, then the subject of this meeting next year will be how North Korea became a nuclear weapon state. Ambassador. Yes. Uh, first of all, you know, the Jonathan to your question, uh, as I've said, Kim Jong-un's uh, a kind of image as a supreme leader has uh, really been deteriorated. Uh, how we can see it if we see this, his uh, the, uh, recent policy speech on America and uh, South Korea, we can easily understand his feelings. In his speech, we can read his frustration, his anger. So uh, as a supreme leader of North Korea, he should not carry his own personal feelings on policy speeches, but on the other way around, he made a, kind, a lot of his personal feelings. That is the great, I think, the change. So that's why I can conclude that the failure of Hanoi summit actually uh, made Kim Jong-un more practical uh, than ever. I think that is very important. So that's why, so far, as I've said in the past, Kim Jong-un did not make any comment. North Korea has not made yet any comment on the Trump's, uh, the a suggestion of opening those nuclear uh, suspected uh, the facility areas. So I think that could be a very good clue for future uh, negotiation. I think the only thing Kim Jong-un is interested 
is keeping his already finished nuclear missiles. He actually, in the long run, is ready to give up the other nuclear material uh, production facilities. How? He wants to reach a kind of phased agreement and phased implementation. I think that is uh, very clear. So that's why what I want to say is that the current, I think, the state with nuclearized North Korea, to some extent, is, is much better than this guy did denuclearization of North Korea. Is there any way we can totally denuclearize North Korea if American uh, North Korea reach any kind of so-called disguided, it's forced denuclearization, then it could be even much more dangerous than for South Korea and the world. So that's why I think uh, that is thing, uh, and another thing about uh, the Russian sanctions, uh, as you said, I think we have to be uh, very practical to so far President Putin's diplomacy. For instance, now North Korea uh, has been in difficult period in the past two or three years, but if Russia supported North Korea to some extent, the current North Korean economy was not in that difficulty right now. But so far, Russia uh, has been withholding all its possible economic assistance to North Korea. Putin only appears to a stage when that country is almost dead. Look at Syria. <laughs> yes. Look at the case of Syria. As North Russians only intervened when Assad was almost dead. And Putin proved to the world that he is the one who can actually change the tide. Look at Venezuela. <laughs> President Maduro was almost finished when all of a sudden pr 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 Putin sent two planes with 100 personnel. So that is uh, the kind of, you know, the character of pre uh, President Putin. Now this time, why this time Putin invite Kim Jong-un? Because Putin wants to make this opportunity when North Korea uh, and President Trump is fully departed apart. So I think, you know, that is one of the uh, reasons why Putin, you know, invited Kim Jong-un at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can go second round. Okay. Yeah. Lady in the second row. Thank you so much for all the panelists for fascinating conversation, in including the uh, interesting intervention by the moderator. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Tay. I have a question about the recent uh, power reshuffle at the uh, Supreme People's Assembly. Um, now we have a Choi Yong-hye replacing Kim Yong-nam, and uh, Choi Son-hee and Hyun Song-ho even joining the Central Committee. Uh, and this visit to Russia, uh, Kim Yong Cho is sidelined. Um, yes. What do you think uh, this implication uh, of the power reshuffle for the future negotiation with the United States? Mm. Okay, then the gentleman behind. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned the second half of 2019. How about uh, second half of 2020? Uh, wouldn't it be a perfect time to negotiate some kind of October surprise for candidate uh, Donald Trump from Kim Jong Un? Is that for me? Oh, okay. Ambassador Tay? No, I didn't uh, quite catch the second question. Yeah, but yeah, I'm sorry. You can, you can answer the first question okay. about the reshuffling no. of the people. All right, yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the recent reshuffle of North Korean leadership. I think uh, the first purpose is to remove uh, the so called incompetent old, you know, the leaders from the post. That is the first thing. The second thing is that uh, Kim Jong un is. Uh, preparing a kind of, you know, long-term uh, uh, the uh, so-called uh, war with uh, Americans in this nuclear uh, strategy. For instance, now, as I have said, the prime minister uh, was changed from Park bong Joo to Kim jae ryong Then we have to focus who is Kim jae ryong and what was his role in the past. Kim jae ryong was the a party head of Zagang province. And Zagang province is the uh, province where only defense industry uh, were there. So he was almost one of the head of North Korea's defense industry. Now he became the prime minister. So what this shows, because of the sanctions, because of the current sanctions, North Korea now cannot maintain the vast defense industry anymore. 
There are many factories in North Korea, but if it is a defense industry factory, for instance, the workers there cannot change their jobs or leave the factory. And the state, on the meanwhile, is obliged to provide food ration to the workers working in defense industry. Now, because of sanctions, the North Korean regime can no longer feed those workers working in that defense industry. So there is now a lot of restructuring of economy from diverting vast national budget from defense to civil mm. economy. So that's why Kim Jong-un actually do not need so many you know, the people in that defense industry. So he wants to move many people, important people, who are not seen in the past, from defense to civil. That is the first Kim Jong-un. Second one is that now we have to see the guy called Ri mang Now he replaced the position of Che ryong -ye. Now he is in charge of North Korea's party affairs. Who was Ri mang -on? Ri mang -on was the head of North Korea's defense industry. So the current reshuffle shows that a lot of people now move from defense to civil. So it shows that the sanctions really shrinked North Korean economy, and actually it started to, I think, remove step by step the real threat, North Korea's real military threat. That is my conclusion. Thank you. On the uh, issue of a possible October surprise by President Trump, uh, go back and take a look at what happened in Singapore. Uh, astonishing. Uh, the use of, of North Korean language in a US DPRK communique uh, that I found rather disturbing. The, the deprioritization of denuclearization in that, commu in that community. Uh, the unilateral suspension of absolutely essential defensive exercises with our ROK allies, with no one being told that that was going to happen. Uh, and then more recently, uh, the effort by the president, right after the designation of those Chinese ent entities for violating uh, international sanctions, uh, the unilateral attempt by the president to undo that uh, via a tweet. So uh, the president is capable of doing some amazing things. So uh, I do not discount the possibility of an October surprise. Thank you. Mm -hmm. General, yeah. so final what? comment? What's the, no, 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 no comment? comment. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. General Yamaguchi. Uh, no. No? Yes, the Mr. last one. I forgot to answer your questions. Why Che Sun Yi and Hyun Sung Wool, these ladies this time, you know, to a uh, very important point. Uh, let's uh, look at the characteristics of uh, Kim Jong Un's the leadership. Now, uh, around Kim Jong Un, there is no any friend. Kim Jong Un in 30s, but the people around him, or most of them, are in 70s or 80s. How can a man in 30s can make friends with the people in 70s and 80s. So that's why, you know, he needs some friend. And there are some people around him. Who are they? It's ladies. His wife, mm -hmm. his sister Kim Yo-jong. So the most, the great accessibility is the people who enjoy in North Korean's leadership is are all ladies. So Kim Yo-jong, Hyun Song-wol, Lee sol Chu. And now, to my impression, Che sun has joined uh, this ladies' club around uh, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> let's read, yes, let's read all those, uh, the recent uh, press conference made by Che sun -hee. Che sun now acts as if he, he, she is the real spokeswoman of Kim Jong-un. We didn't know what he thinks, only Che sun knows. Che sun always says that now Kim Jong-un thinks this and that, it is Kim Jong-un's idea, Kim Jong-un is priced straight low. So then how can Che sun read Kim Jong-un's mind? Because she has the accessibility to Kim Jong-un through either Lee sol Chu or Hyun sung wol or Kim yo Jong, whatever. So that's why I think the main people who are now around Kim Jong-un are ladies' club. As somebody, who's as somebody who's married to a Korean woman, I can speak uh, volumes about how shrewd and capable they are. I'm glad to be here um, because yeah. I learned a lot. And uh, one thing is, uh, I, I was wondering if uh, the marginal utility of lifting sanctions is becoming uh, lower and lower. Mm -hmm. But um, I learned that the marginal utility of uh, lifting sanctions is still high. 
high enough uh, to uh, compel the North Korea uh, to do something. Yes, of course. I think uh, just one more thing. I was surprised to learn that American administration issued all those 130 violation smuggling cases after Hanoi summit. Why they didn't do it before <laughs> Hanoi summit? <laughs> so that's, that means that America actually allowed North Korea's smuggling in 1918 uh, 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 just for the sake of the summit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there is a lot of things we can do in the field of sanctions. Thank you, thank you. We are a little bit behind our schedule, but uh, let me uh, spend one, just one minute, because actually I totally agree with what Evan said in revising our policy toward North Korea, but I like the one more adjective, comprehensive, massive pressure campaign. Mm -hmm. So actually, back, uh, go, let's go back to 2017. We actually use our diplomatic tools, economic tools, and military tools. That's those, the, the combination of those three toolbox actually forced North Korea to come to the negotiation table. So we should not forget that and to think about it. And second, we have to think about external general elements. We have to think about what is the meaning of denuclearization, make it more clear, and share the common concept among sure. ourselves. So I'd like to thank each and every one of the speakers for the uh, sharing their thought and experience with us. Please let, uh, join me in thanking Thank their you. contributions. Thank you. Thank you.